All righty. So if you're brand new with us, uh, my name's Dylan. I'm one of the pastors. Super excited that you're here today. Um, we're in the second week of a series called uh, New Marriage, Same Spouse. The big idea being um, you can have a brand new marriage. You can have a better marriage. You can have a healed marriage. Um, and it does not take a different spouse for it to happen. It can be with the same spouse you've always had. In fact, we would say that is God's desire for you. So here's how I want to set up today. We kind of talked about this uh, in community time, but how many of y'all have ever had a situation uh, where you worked with a family member specifically? Like you may be on the same team, same band, same staff, whatever. Okay, we, we've kind of kind of been there. Um, I've had several different opportunities to do that throughout my life. So um, growing up, me and my brother, I, I have a twin brother, uh, which he's an attorney. He works in Johnston County. If you ever see me and I'm wearing a suit, it's not me. It's my brother. Um, so don't say, hey, Dylan, you'll get a really weird look and he'll tell me about it later and it'll be great. Um, but we always played on the same baseball team growing up. And, and, and that had that was great a lot of the time. Uh, me and my dad, we coached uh, the same high school baseball team for a couple years while I was in college. My wife and I worked on the same church staff. She did graphics. She's super creative, actually designs all of our stuff. Um, and there's, there's a lot of fun in that so many times, but, but it's not without its challenges because like, like, like for instance, when I was we're working on the same staff as my wife, like, how do you tell your wife, I really don't like what you designed, right? Like, 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 it, it, it's, like it's kind of like saying, I don't like what you made for dinner. Right, like, like, like that can just kind of be an awkward thing. Sometimes there can be a kind of tension with family members that that maybe you don't experience with other people. But what I found, at least this was my experience, and maybe you found something similar. Um, overall, I found working in, on the same team or on the same staff or or whatever with a family member for me at the end of the day was always a benefit because yes, it had different tensions, but at the end of the day, the chemistry was really well because at the end of the day, we didn't go to separate homes, we went home because we're family. And when we lived in the same home, and that just kind of, I found, brought a cohesion and an understanding that, that maybe that didn't really exist with somebody that, that I did not live with. You might say, what does that have to do with anything? That is actually the same dynamic that is supposed to exist within marriage between two followers of Jesus. Because believe it or not, if you as a husband and you as a wife, if you're both followers of Jesus, you have a relational dynamic that actually supersedes the relationship between husband and wife. And I'm just going to let you know, especially if you're not a Christian, new to church, this is going to sound really weird, but it's actually super powerful. And so I'll explain it. There won't be, there won't be like, I'm going to just leave this hanging here. So here's the idea. Marriage between two Christians is more than husband and wife. It's brother and sister in Christ. Now, if you're not a Christian, you might sound, that sounds really weird. In no world is like brother and sister better than husband and wife. And that sounds bizarre. And I get it. And actually in the first century, like one of the charges against the church was that they were like kind of incestuous because they called people brother and sister. And they're like, that's weird. And I know for some people, like the idea there is weird. So you may say, well, how is that a good thing? The reason that is a good thing is because at the end of the day, your relationship to each other in the family of God will last even if your marriage doesn't. And it actually informs your marriage. It actually encourages you to work on your marriage and make your marriage work now. Because if you're both Christians, even if you split up now, you're going to see each other in eternity. Like, 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 let's say, let's say hypothetically, let's say hypothetically, you're like, I'm done with my spouse. Like, yeah, I know they're a Christian, whatever, but I'm just sick of them. I'm done. So you split or whatever. You go 60 years, you die, you're walking down heaven one day and you're like, how are you here? And they're like, you stuck with me forever. And now I don't know that that's the way that'll work out exactly. But well, the, the point I'm making is this. If, if we're both followers of Jesus now and we're going to be in the same room in heaven for eternity, then, then I think that gives us every reason to, to make it work in the here and now instead of just kind of washing our hands and being done with it. So that's how it informs our marriage relationship. And we're going to talk a lot about kind of exactly what that looks like as we relate to each other, not primarily as husbands and wives, but primarily as followers of Jesus as fellow believers. Now, that does beg a couple of questions that I think are helpful to ask and answer. Um, one may be, well, well, what if I'm not married? If you're not married, and by the way, if you're if you're dating or engaged, if you're not married, you're still single. That that's that's a thing. You're still you're still technically single. Um, but if you're not married, this will actually inform your dating relationship because your primary way of relating to each other is not as boyfriend or girlfriend. It's not as fiance, and I don't even know. I guess co fiance, whatever. Um, it's primarily as you're both fellow believers. If in fact you're both fellow believers. 
Now, the other questions that begs is, well, what, what if I'm not a Christian? Well, if you're not a Christian, first off, I'm excited you're here. And the primary invitation to you today is the primary thing Jesus invites all of us to. And it's not actually a better marriage. It's not a better relationship with somebody of the opposite sex. The primary thing Jesus invites us into is a new life in him. And so if you're here, you're not a Christian, you're trying to find out how to get your marriage better. The primary thing Jesus is inviting you into is not necessarily a better marriage. It's a relationship with Christ. And we'll talk about that. And which, by the way, that'll actually give your marriage a fighting chance to be a great marriage. The third question it kind of brings up is, well, what if I'm a Christian and my spouse is not? Well, in that case, the invitation for you is, is to simply, by, 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 by applying what we talk about today from Scripture, the invitation for you is to simply show the gospel to your spouse. And maybe, just maybe, the thing that will draw your spouse to faith in Christ is you showing the gospel and relating to them as Jesus would. That may be the thing that brings them to faith in Christ. So that's how this is going to all work out. So if you have a Bible, you can turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, we'll start there, then we'll go to Philippians, and we'll talk about what this looks like. So the change that happens here, and the way this starts to transform our marriages, is our relationships, especially in marriage, are no longer primarily husband and wife. It's we relate to each other as fellow believers. And Ephesians 5.21 sets up all this. And just to give you some context here, last week we kind of left off with this idea that for your marriage to thrive, the Holy Spirit has to be in the driver's seat because none of us are actually capable of effectively directing our lives. And so then Paul goes on to explain what it looks like to be under the control of the Holy Spirit in our relationships. And he talks about the relationship between a wife to a husband and a husband to a wife. And then he talks about kids to parents and parents to kids. And then he talks to slaves and masters and masters and slaves, which in our context would be employers to employees and vice versa. And he talks about all this, not primarily from the sense of here's the role and here's how you interact with the role, but primarily from here's how two believers in these roles should interact with each other. And the way he sets all of it up starts with Ephesians 5.21, and this is what Paul writes. He says this, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And so the primary relationship that works here between fellow believers is we submit to each other, and I know submission's a dirty word, and we'll talk about that in a second, but, but out of reverence for Christ, out of the fact that Jesus is in charge, and Jesus is king, and Jesus is Lord, and we owe him our obedience out of reverence for Christ, what do we do? We submit ourselves, we voluntarily subject ourselves, we voluntarily put ourselves under each other, because at the end of the day, that's what Jesus told us to do. And by the way, this will come up a little bit next week, but I'll just put a plug in for it right now. At the end of the day, what God tells us to do, even if it offends our cultural sensibilities, like that's what we go with. Why? Because he's God and he's smarter than me and smarter than you. And I just think if you're all knowing, it's probably best to just kind of listen to whatever you say. That's kind of where I'm at. So this is how God calls us to govern our relationships as fellow believers. The idea here is this. You can jot it down. In the family of God, we submit ourselves to each other. Or you could think of it this way. We put each other ahead of ourselves as an act of worship to Jesus. So the way this works out, whether it's in marriage or whatever other relationship you have, your primary goal is to honor and to glorify Jesus. Your primary goal is to worship Jesus through the way you relate to each other. And in, in marriage, and really in any relationship between fellow believers, the primary that way that works out is I put other people ahead of me. I'm others focused. I look to the needs of others instead of myself. And so that specifically applies to submit yourselves to each other. Now, with that in mind, let's, let's talk about a few different dynamics. We talked about we do this out of reverence for Christ. So the idea there is like, even if you find this a little like, I don't really know that I want to do that. And we don't naturally want to do this. Like we are naturally super, super self-centered. Just ask anybody that has a toddler. Toddlers, they're self-centered. They want to do what they want to do. Um, we're naturally that way. And so this is not a natural default thing to us. And so... We have to let the Lord change us to make us into this. And you may say, well, well, what if I don't feel like doing it? You do it anyway. Why? Well, I'll give you an example. Uh, when my dad and my mom would give me an order growing up, I didn't really have an option to debate about it. 
It wasn't like, well, you know, I don't really want to do it. It's kind of like, this is not a democracy. It's a dictatorship, and you just do what we say. And, and that worked for me just fine. I know for some people, personalities, you had to know like the why behind everything. Here's what you need to know in the family of God. God will not and probably won't give you many whys as to why he wants you to do something. He just wants you to do it. And you just need to trust him. Why? Out of reverence for Christ. Because Jesus is God and you're not. So that's what Jesus calls us to. Um, and Jesus wants you to obey him because, listen, he really does have your best interest at heart. We have to understand that. So one of the things we have to understand here is in the family of God, God specifically, God the Father relates to you as your heavenly daddy. He does not really relate to unbelievers as their heavenly daddy. You can, he can become your heavenly daddy if you're an unbeliever, if you step into the family of God. But in the family of Christ specifically, God the Father relates to you as your heavenly daddy. As your daddy, guess what? He wants the best for you. He really does. And so when he calls us to do things that don't seem fun or don't seem comfortable, we can actually trust him enough to do that. But there's also another really interesting dynamic that was pointed out to me here recently that that should inform us on why we do this particularly in marriage and we kind of subject ourselves to each other. If your spouse is a Christian, God is not just your father. He is also your father-in-law. And he is very, very concerned with how you treat his other kid. So it's not just, well, God has my best interest at heart. No, he also has your spouse's best interest at heart. And he wants his heart for your spouse to be your heart for your spouse. Does that make sense? And so this is why we put each other ahead of ourselves. And that's why we submit ourselves to each other. Because God's in charge. He's king. What he says goes. He's our father. He has our best interest at heart. But he also has the interest of our spouse at heart. He's our, father, our spiritual father-in-law. And so his heart for our spouse needs to become our heart for our spouse. And that looks like submitting ourselves to each other. So what does that look like? Because that's a dirty, dirty word. Um, submitting, submitting. It's, it's, it's a dirty word. Because when we think of submitting, what we often think of in our culture is, well, that means I'm a doormat. Kind of like Cinderella, right? Oh, y'all saw Cinderella growing up, right? We saw Cinderella. Yeah, like, like her, her stepmother stomped all over her. Her sisters stomped all over her. Even the cat, which, by the way, was named Lucifer. <laughs> That's not even a cat joke. That's just an objective observation. You don't see any dogs in movies named Lucifer, so I'm just, I'm just throwing that out there. Even the cat stomped all over her. And so that's kind of our cultural idea of submission. And we're like, I ain't doing that. I ain't going to be a doormat. I'm not going to let people just kind of stomp all over me like I'm nothing. And so we kind of push back on that. And so we need to say, okay, that's not the idea here. That's not what God has in mind. God has in mind something very, very different. And Paul sets it up in a letter to the Philippians in, in uh, chapter 1, verse 27. What he says is this. Whatever happens... Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And I would even argue, and we'll talk a little more about what, what that looks like in Philippians, but I would argue that line, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, that's what, define, that, that's what defines what biblical submission actually looks like. And we get in this idea of a life worthy of the gospel, which that demands that we unpack what is the gospel. The gospel is this. It's the good news that even though you and I are not born good, we're actually born evil, we're actually born thoroughly unlovable because of our sin, even though we're born that way, even though we're born as enemies of God, separated from God, in no way, shape, or form deserving God's mercy, God, because of his mercy, because of his love, because of his compassion, sent his son Jesus to earth to live a perfect life that we couldn't live and then die a death that we should have died because the penalty for sin is death, but our own death could not possibly pay for our sin because our sin is cosmic treason. It's infinitely evil measured against an infinitely good God, and only someone infinite in nature and infinite in perfection could cancel out our sin, which is why the only way for us to, have a, to be saved was for Jesus to come to earth and die on a cross to pay for our sin and then come back to life so that through his his life, we could have life. That's the good news, and that is the only way for us to be saved. So what does it mean to live a life worthy of that? Well, think about what Jesus did. Jesus sacrificed himself for 
us. More specifically, Jesus sacrificed himself for his marriage because his family is called the bride of Christ. So Jesus literally laid down his life for his marriage in literally the most excruciating way possible. Because because what happened when Jesus laid down his life, he wasn't executed by firing squad. He he was first, first brutally tortured and ripped open by a cat of nine tails And then nailed to a cross, which is literally the most painful way to kill somebody. Where he had, the only way he could breathe was pushing up through the nails driven through his feet just so he could have a breath. And he did that till he died. That's what it took for him to make a way for us to be saved. That's what it took for him to have a bride. And so when you start thinking about marriage, what does it look like to live a life worthy of the gospel? It means sacrificing your very life, laying down your very life being forgiving because when jesus was being nailed to the cross he didn't say man these guys are idiots he said father forgive them they don't know what they're doing it means being gracious it means being merciful it means laying down every single part of yourself that's a life worthy of the gospel now just think about this how might that change your marriage if that was the attitude you approached your marriage with that, that whatever happened, you, you would voluntarily subject yourself to your spouse. Listen, listen, even if they were being morons, because I know you might say, well, Dylan, that sounds all fine and good. <clears throat> but you just haven't met my husband or wife, or at least you don't know them very well. They're an idiot. And I suffer through their antagonistic stupidity all the time. I can't do this. Well, listen, when Paul wrote this passage... He was chained to a Roman soldier. If there was anybody that could have complained, it had been Paul. Paul, like Paul didn't say, whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, unless you're in prison. If you're in prison, then gripe, complain, moan, because it just sucks. No, he said, he's literally under arrest here, awaiting trial, and he says, whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of of the gospel of Christ. No conditions on that. And that is a tough pill to swallow in marriage. Because what that means as applied to marriage is, even if your spouse is, is genuinely being an idiot, and let's just be honest, we can be real, right? Sometimes we all act like idiots. Right? Right? Husbands especially can say amen. Right? Like when your wife is pouring your heart out and, you're, and you just kind of zone out and then she's like, what I say? Then you're like, mm, I was owned out. I was watching a game, wasn't really paying attention. We all do stupid stuff sometimes, right? And so we need somebody individually to treat us like Jesus treated us. And Jesus calls us to do the same thing for somebody else, even when they're not acting in a way that shows they deserve that. Because at the end of the day, we didn't exactly act in a way that showed us that we deserve Jesus to die for us because we didn't deserve it, but he did it anyway. And that'll transform your marriage. So what does that exactly look like more specifically? When you start laying down your life for your spouse, when you start living a life worthy of the gospel and applying that to your marriage, there's a few different results here. They won't be on the screen, but we can jot them down. The first one is this. It's unity. Unity. Philippians 2, 1 through 2, Paul goes on to say this. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, so if you're a follower of Jesus, you're united with Jesus, you're a part of his family, if any common comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, so you're in the same family here, this is what's going on, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one Mind. The idea is this. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you're united with Christ personally, and then in the family of God, you have this common sharing with the Spirit, you're united as a family, then the only logical outcome of that or the outcome that should happen from that is you're united. Guess what? You do the same thing. You have the same goal. What does it mean to have the same goal? Well, let's use an example from from marriage. Um, When my wife and I were first married, we committed to doing a weekly date night, but we had some tension because we had slightly different goals for date night. So, So my goal for date night was to go and eat a lot of food and then go home and cuddle. 
right? Most guys can probably relate to that. My wife's idea of a great night was have like this connection with each other over a, over a slow, casual dinner. So you might imagine that when my preferred date night options in the early days were Golden Corral and CeCe's, not exactly setting the stage for cuddling later, right? <laughs> Not at all. It's like, are you trying to like play yourself out of the game there? Apparently so as a, as a newly married moron. <laughs> Over the years, as we have come to a common understanding, which means we don't go to CC's and go and corral on date night. Even in my birthday month, I don't because I'm like, I just, that's just not going to go great. It's hard to connect with somebody when you're constantly up and down getting cheap food. So now that we have a common understanding of date night, the result is we have two kids. <laughs> right? Because the store decided that they would bring us to it on date night. That's just kind of how it happened. <laughs> when you're working towards the same goal, what happens? Unity happens. You move in the same direction. When you understand you're both in the family of God, guess what? You can work towards the same goal. What is the same goal? The same goal is glorifying Jesus with your life, particularly in this case with your marriage. You know what that means the goal is not? The goal is not for your spouse to make you happy. The goal is not for your spouse to be kind of like this tool you use to further your career or whatever it happens to be. The goal is, hey, how can we best demonstrate Jesus to each other and to others through our marriage? How can we best glorify Jesus? Because after all, we're united with Christ. We commonly share in the same spirit. We're part of the same family. We're fellow believers. And the goal of fellow believers is to point people to Jesus, starting with each other, starting with your kids, by the way, and then to the rest of the world. That's the goal. When we're unified, guess what? We have the same goal, same idea. Point others to Jesus. How different might your marriage be if the goal changes now from how can my spouse make me happy to, man, how can we point others to Jesus through, the, through our marriage? The result from that would be the second thing after unity. It would be sacrifice. Sacrifice. Sacrifice is giving things up. Paul puts it like this in Philippians 2. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. In other words, don't do anything just because you want to do it. And don't do anything to puff up your ego. And can we just admit that can be a tension in marriage? That we often do things because we want to feel good and we want to look awesome. And that's kind of the way we drive the ship. And that just doesn't work out. We're commanded not to do that. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vacancy. Rather in humility, value others above yourselves. That sounds really familiar, doesn't it? It sounds kind of like submit yourselves to one another out of reverence for Christ. Value one another over yourself, specifically in marriage as we apply that to marriage. Value your spouse's needs and wants and desires and little personality ticks. Value those above your needs and wants and desires and personality ticks. Might that change your marriage? I think so. I think so. And then he goes on to say this in verse 4. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. So that begs a question. What is, the be what is in the best interest of your spouse in marriage? I would argue it moves us to something like this. You can write this down. As brother and sister in Christ, we have the same goal in life to build up others in Christ starting with building up each other in Christ. The primary goal of you as a husband or the primary goal of you as a wife is to build your spouse up in their relationship with Jesus and do whatever in the world it takes to facilitate that happening. So let me ask you this. By the way you currently treat your spouse, is your spouse on the road to becoming everything Jesus wants them to be? Or, alternatively, are you kind of sort of spiritual dead weight on your spouse? And you're kind of holding them back from becoming who Jesus wants them to be in him. This applies to dating, dating couples, or those who may be future married, whatever. Um, 
your primary goal in dating is to make sure the person you're dating, because until you're married, they may not be your spouse one day. Like you're like, I don't want to hear that. It, it, it could be true. Like I'm not trying to like rain all over your parade or you know do whatever in your Cheerios. I'm just saying it might not happen. Your primary objective in dating is to make sure the person you're dating can become everything Jesus made them to be. And so you're going to make decisions that facilitate that happening. It starts to change the goal. It moves away from self-centeredness and it moves towards being other-centered. And the best thing we can do for others is help them become who Jesus made them to be. That will transform your relationships. And what you'll start doing is you'll start sacrificing your needs and your desires and your wants for the sake of not necessarily the other person's needs and wants and desires, but sacrificing primarily for what Jesus wants for the other person. So the question is this, what might it take for you to sacrifice in such a way that facilitates what Jesus wants for the other person, particularly your spouse, coming into reality. What needs to happen? We can talk about a whole lot of things, but we're going to get a little more specific about that next weekend. It'll be great. So come back. It'll be fun. The third thing that happens, when all this is working together, when we are submitting ourselves to each other, when we're, we're subjecting ourselves to each other, when the result is unity, we have the same goal, we build each other up in Christ, uh, we sacrifice for each other. At the end of the day, the most beautiful thing that happens is the, the third thing, which is this. We showcase the gospel. We showcase the gospel. And that's the end result of this anyway. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. This is what Paul writes to kind of cap all this off. He says, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, and then this is the model for us, rather he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of God a servant, by the way, and serving people who did not deserve it. Maybe one of the hardest things you and I will be called to do in marriage is to serve our spouse in the moments they do not remotely deserve it. But again, we didn't deserve to have Jesus lay down his life for us, but he did it anyway. He took the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Why did he do this? So that he could have his bride, the church, brought into existence. There was no other way for that to happen. And I would argue the only way for you to have a gospel showcasing marriage is for you to lay down your life for your spouse. It's to do this. It's to sacrifice. And you may not necessarily have to die to die for them, but if you're a follower of Jesus, Jesus has called every single one of us to a cross. To die to yourself daily, to pick up your cross and follow him. It, like The thing that has to die for your marriage to thrive is yourself. Like That has to be put to death. But when that happens, we start showcasing the gospel. Why? Because the nature of a servant, first off, it's humble. Jesus was humble. When we're showcasing the gospel, our marriages will be marked by incredible humility. What does humility do? It puts the other one above yourself. Humility is a big part of this. Serving is a big part of this. When was the last time you served your spouse? Instead of expecting your spouse to serve you. Like, 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 think about that. When was the last time? And when was the last time you voluntarily did it and didn't have to be prompted to do it? When was the last time you served your spouse? When you serve your spouse, guys, that showcases the gospel. And guess what? Your kids need to see that if you got kids. Because one of the best opportunities you have for sharing the gospel is in your marriage to your children. Like we talk, uh, you know, often about, you know, we're called to, to multiply disciple making disciples. Like you have a beautiful, like 18 year opportunity to do that if you have a child. It's to show the gospel, share the gospel and train them to do that so that one day they'll do that for their own kids. 
Your kids need to see that for the sake of the gospel. When we're showcasing the gospel, um, obedience is a part of that. Jesus humbled himself. He became obedient to what the Father told him to do. Not my will, but your will be done. Where do you need to express that to the Lord in your marriage today? Not my, not my will be done, but, but, but your will be done, Heavenly Father. Where does that need to happen in your marriage? A life that showcases the gospel will be radically obedient to what God commands you to do. Which, by the way, since kids are kind of a part of this thing many times, um, I'll figure out the way to put this real quick. If you want your kids to live lives of radical obedience to Jesus, then you need to live lives of radical obedience to Jesus and not make really, not to be rude, but really dumb excuses for your disobedience. Because guys, do as I say, not as I do is not effective. All it does is it completely burns your kids on Christianity. Because they'll say, well, mom and dad went to church and they said they believed this stuff, but they treated me like garbage and kind of treated each other like garbage. But then they said, I need to follow Jesus. It didn't seem to you know, do any good for them. So why in the world why would I want any part of that? So not to put too fine a finger on it, for those of you who have kids or those of you who will have kids in the future, like... The eternities of your kids could very well be at stake by the way you treat each other in your marriage. It is that serious, and we need to approach it with that level of seriousness and have radical obedience to Jesus because your kids are watching. And kids have a really good bullcrap detector. They really do. So be radically obedient, just like Jesus was obedient even to death on a cross. That's the last thing that's present in a marriage that showcases the gospel, is you die to yourself. What does that look like? It means that your desires, your hobbies, your wants, your needs, your desires, your goals are not the primary thing pulling your marriage. Jesus is the primary thing pulling your marriage. His example is the primary thing pulling your marriage. But the reason that will happen is not because you're trying. It's because the gospel has invaded your heart and Jesus has captured you and made you his. And when you start hanging out with Jesus because you're his, his family member now, you start to resemble him more and more and more. And resembling him more and more and more means I look to the needs of others instead of myself. Now, that preach is really good. That's very hard to implement, right? It's very, very hard to implement. And I'm just going to be honest. There will probably be times if you're here and you're married this week where you're like, I don't feel like doing that. Or maybe it's really late at night. You're tired, but your spouse has had a hard day and they just need to talk. And you're like, I just want to go to bed. And you'll be tempted to tune out. Or maybe you'll get into an argument and maybe you'll think they did something like, like they were obviously wrong and you just want to argue and bicker about it and that sort of thing instead of laying down your life. Or perhaps your spouse needs you, but you have something that you really, really wanted to do, but you need to be there for your spouse. But you are, are you not really into that right now? So what do you do when you just don't feel like doing this? Because can we be honest? There's so many times when we just don't feel like doing this, right? Right? Can somebody say amen, be honest in here? We often don't feel like doing this. So why do we do it at the end of the day? Well, Paul writes this. He says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. When I was a kid, and my dad in particular would tell me to do something, there would be some times why, when I would ask why, because as a kid, that's your favorite question, why? And my dad's answer, which I look forward to using on my kids sometime, was very simply this, because I said so. Okay. You know why you're going to do this in your marriage if you're a follower of Jesus? Because your heavenly daddy and your heavenly daddy-in-law said so. And listen, if you're a follower of Jesus, that needs to be good enough for us. That needs to be good enough for us. And that doesn't mean you won't have questions sometimes. That doesn't mean you won't have doubts sometimes. It don't mean you won't have skepticism sometimes. But at the end of the day, if God said it, that needs to be enough for us because he's God and we're not. And so that's why we're going to do this. We're not going to do it because we feel like it. We're not going to do it because it's easy. We're not going to do it because, you know, we're kind of being guilted into it. We're going to do it because at the end of the day, Jesus is God and we're not. He's in charge. God exalted him 
to the highest place. Not me. By the way, he didn't exalt your spouse to the highest place either because perhaps some of you are looking for your spouse or your boyfriend or your girlfriend to fill a need that only God can fill. He exalted Jesus to the highest place. That in the name of Jesus, every knee would bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. If Jesus is Lord, guess who can't be Lord? That would be me. There is only one seat in your life for who is Lord, and Jesus Christ is the only one meant to occupy it. But when he occupies it, that's literally the best thing for us. That's literally what changes our lives. It's what changes our eternity. And I can promise you, when Jesus is sitting in that seat, that will change your marriage. Now, notice what I did not say. I did not say it would change your spouse. Because some of y'all are thinking, man, I hope my spouse is getting this. If that's you, just, just stop it. This is for you to hear and for you to apply. God will deal with your spouse in his timing and in his way. What he wants to do primarily is change you. And so often the way God will change our marriages is not by changing our spouse, but by changing our disposition towards our spouse, by making us showcase the gospel toward our spouse. And over time, as they're shown the gospel, the gospel begins to transform them as well. And that's the point of marriage at the, beginning, at the end of the day anyway. It is to showcase what it looks like for two entities who are nothing alike, just like people and God, nothing alike. Guess what? We're brought together. We're united through the work of Christ on the cross through his life and death and resurrection. Marriage, two entities, nothing alike. We would all agree with that, right? Men and women, nothing alike at all. That's funny. We can laugh. Ha, ha, ha. And yet they're called to be brought together and united permanently through this work of God called marriage. That's the point at the end of the day, to showcase what Jesus did for us, and we do it through our marriages. So let's pray. Father God, I pray that as, as we depart from here in a few minutes, Lord, I pray we would leave with an, a better understanding of what you want to do through our marriages by showing your work in Christ through our marriages. I pray you would make us sacrificial, that you would make us submissive to each other, that you would make us humble, and that we, just like Jesus did for us in laying down his life, we would lay down our lives for our spouse so they could be built up in Christ.